So welcome to Talking Data Equity. My name is Heather Krause, and I am very, very happy to see you today. Uh, talking data equity is something that we all count does almost every Friday, not every single Friday, but most Fridays. And uh, the purpose of talking data equity is to get together and have an informal conversation about the realities, the lived experiences that we are all having while we work on data equity. And so we talk about what's going really well when we're trying to embed equity in our work, where we're having struggles, uh, what tools are working, where we're meeting uh, barriers and road bumps. Um, sometimes we have very, very technical topics that are kind of deep into data analysis. Sometimes um, we go deep in a different direction where it's not necessarily technical, but we're talking maybe about the, the nuanced emotions and power dynamics of uh, collecting data equity. And sometimes we have special guests and today we have special guests and we are doing something really, really cool. What we are doing today is um, our special guests are a group of fabulous folks from Health Leads. So if you haven't heard of Health Leads, Health Leads is an organization that operates nationally in the United States. They're based in Boston. And um, you will uh, probably recognize <laughs> some of our special guests today uh, because they are a regular part of this um, Talking Data Equity community. We have Artrice, who is a, the Senior Director of Programs at Health Leads. We have Daniel, who is a Program Manager at Health Leads. And then I don't know if they're on screen, but we have Christina, who's the Senior Manager of Programs. So you can feel free to uh, come on screen if you feel like you want to, uh, Christina. And we also have Hiba, who is uh, a brand new intern for Health Leads. And Health Leads is a very, very cool organization doing some really, really innovative work that focuses on addressing the, the root causes of racial inequity in health and understanding it and moving the needle on uh, improving it, fixing it. And one of the things that they are doing is uh, a new research project. And we are gonna try something a little bit new here at Talking Data Equity today, and that we're gonna talk together about the research project that they're in the process of creating. And we're, we're gonna talk together about um, how we might make some choices <laughs> in, that, in that process. So we're kind of gonna, gonna do that live today. So uh, you're all part of a very exciting experiment. And like always, um, we, we do uh, expect everyone to respond and behave like the graceful, classy folks you are <laughs> and, and uh, treat everybody really, really well um, because everybody here uh, is absolutely doing their best. And to answer the question uh, that you're going to ask me next, almost all of the resources we talk about today will be posted in the forum. So you don't have to try and write everything down because uh, I'm sure this is going to be a very active discussion. So I am now going to stop talking and um, introduce you all to Artrice Morrison, fabulous person and um, Senior Director of Programs at Health Leads. Thank you so much, Artrice, for coming and agreeing to participate in this experiment. I am very excited. Well, Heather, thank you so much. I too am excited. I actually feel like I've been uh, at a, I'm at a rock concert and I've been in the audience going, oh, and then I'm able to come up stage and, and sing a song with you. So I really appreciate this opportunity. A true big fan um, and a true convert since uh, last year when I took the boot camp. And then my colleague Daniel took the boot camp in, the, in last fall. And really the idea, and I was sharing earlier about, you know, I have a 30 year career in nonprofit. And in that work in program development, we've created so many surveys and gathered so much information from 
from the, the clients and the patients and the folks that I, I have been working with. But we just sat in a group, you know, all the people who are the decision makers sat together, you know, decided what questions we were to ask, not necessarily being intentional or thoughtful about it, and just and then just went out, gathered information, and then picked and cho chose what data we were going to use and information we were going to use to tell the story that we already kind of wanted to tell anyway. And so, you know, this opportunity of really digging into the work that we do at Health Leads to really helps to interrupt inequity and help to, to really think about the harm that's being done. Um, this gives us an opportunity to use the We All Count framework to really say, this data is not objective. It is so subjective because we're making so many choices along the way. So how do we build equity into those choices? And so I thank you for, for bringing this you know, forward so that we're able to kind of use this and, and hopefully, or at least for me in my career, undo some of the harm that I've, I've navigated through with good intentions, of course, right? Um, but so thank you. And so with that said, I wanted to share um, the, the project that we're doing at Health Leads that really hopes to, you know, bring some light into community referral networks and really help those who are navigating those spaces to take a moment to, to look and be intentional about the work. And so we call it the Repair Project, and it's research to pursue and advance racial equity through community, community networks. And we're talking about referral networks. So next slide. And as Heather shared, we're from Health Leads and we're an innovative hub that really works to works with community uh, based organizations, healthcare institutions to really try to figure out how do we um, help disrupt and how, uh, you know, white supremacy culture, how do we help really look at anti racism um, practices that create more equity, more inclusive, inclusivity for our, those who are least least resourced and most marginalized. Next slide. And so through the goal of this project, what we're trying to do is inform and change referral networks. Again, that's community referral networks. And I'll give you an explanation of what that means to us. Um, and, that, and then help the investments to advance racial health equity. So really, looking at our audience as those who fund these programs, those who provide uh, funding and, uh, and financial support to these programs and giving them information. So it helps in their decision-making when they're supporting these communities throughout the country. So we really wanna understand the impact that the networks have on community as well as promote best practices. And so we're looking at this research project as an opportunity to gather information um, not only from the, the organizations themselves or referral networks themselves, but the communities they serve and some of the partners they work with. Thank you, next slide. And for us, community referral networks are, if you're not familiar, are systems and platforms developed by health and social services, uh, systems to make it easier to connect people with available resources. And so really working as hubs and connecting, you know, uh, whether it's workforce development, food and nutrition, housing, healthcare, and making sure that those are uh, developed on a platform, whether it's a technology platform or a community governance platform. And, we're, and there's different forms of that. So we're trying to really look at what are the best practices within these organizations and these systems that people can share throughout the country? When we think about racial health equity, we're talking about the intentional continuous process to eliminate differences in health outcomes, such that all people have fair and opportunity to achieve optimal health, regardless of their race or ethnicity. And when we think about health equity, same thing around, everyone has a fair and just opportunity as, to be as healthy as possible regardless of race, place, gender, or age. And again, we will use the, we'll use the term BIPOC in this conversation, meaning black, indigenous, and people of color. And specifically, specifically we're talking about people and communities are historically marginalized, historically excluded as part of, part of what we're really hoping to lift up. Next slide. 
So important to us as our goal of what we're trying to do is how we're trying to do it. And we take the approach that was introduced to us by the National Equity Project um, of liberatory equitable design practices. We're really kind of seeing the issue, seeing the problem, engaging the community in it and making sure that that is, makes, makes sense and identifying what, what the issues are and then, and then trying and acting. And so we're, re and in this process, really hoping to interrupt inequity and really create and lift up shared power, shared voice, shared decision-making, shared ownership is really what, what we're looking to do. Next slide. So just to give you a little idea of the people that we're um, working with. So participating network organizations are, are organizations all across the country from California to Virginia, to Rhode Island, to Texas. So we're working with eight par participating network organizations to really gather a small slice of information that we hope that has widespread reach we're doing that with also a community advisory group that has been identified by the participating network organization. And we're working with 16 uh, advisory group members. A few of them are on the call today. I saw Gary's, Gary Bliss on the, on the call and he's part of our advisory group um, committee. And we really appreciate, oh, you just turned his camera on and waving, um, appreciate his impact and his voice. It's been quite helpful. And then we always have to be uh, thankful of, of the thoughtful um, support that we get financially to create this project. Um, our common spirit benefactor really, really, they want to understand like how, how their community referral networks are impacting community. How is it making a difference and how they can help? And so they really are the, the they they spearheaded this project in terms of financial support, along with Blue, Blue Shield of California and the California Healthcare Foundation. So we really appreciate their influence and uh, and support. So next slide. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Gary. I saw that quickly. So with that said. This has been a uh, 18 to 24 month project that we've been uh, embarking on. We started last winter of 2022, really developing our plan, really trying to understand um, the equity and all of the, the work that we're doing. And then with that said, we um, recruited the partner, we did an RFI and recruited the, the participating network organizations, the PNOs that, that I'll be referring to. Um, and we introduced the We All Count uh, framework, and we explained that although we're gathering, it's a research project, we're gathering information, but we're going to be intentional about our choices. We're going to think about what we're doing, and we're going to make sure that we're going to, in the choices that we make, that we're being intentional of the choices that we make, and that no data is objective. It's all subjective based on all the choices that we're making along the way. We then worked with the, the participating network organizations to um, recruit community advisory group that was going to be the governing body of this decision-making of these research questions of the project. And so we've onboarded that group in, in the uh, between December and March of this year. We then introduced the We All Count framework um, with them and then been wa walking them through the process. So we've done the power and influence um, and we actually kind of modified it a bit to make it relevant for our work. So the power and influence uh, mapping um, with all the arrows going back and forth and deciding who's making decisions making along the way. We then um, set them through the motivation and limit, limit, limiting, um, uh, the limiting barriers, the research restrictions in the process. We then did a whole session on definitions so that we can all be you know, clear about what are we talking about and, and can we all agree on these terms? Uh, and then we started saying, well, who do we want to hear from and what do we want to know? And then we took them through that microscope scope process. And then we got to the point where now we have some, some questions that we've developed. Um, really, you're in draft. I have, we have a research and development team here at Health Leads who we've had them eyeball it just to so you know, when you make, when you develop questions, you want to make sure that they're going to get you some answers that are actually, you know, answering the question. So they've been helping to keep the spirit of the questions, but help tweak the language with the mindset of 
how do we be inclusive with our language? How do we be mindful with our language? Um, and so we're, we've done that. And so we hope, we thought June, but it was probably gonna take us into July um, in terms of data collection, which brings us to where we are now when we're thinking about like what happens next in terms of the demographics piece. If we have the, if we're, we're looking at the, like kind of the body of the questions, we know there's a foundation we need to create to, to gather information from the people that, that we wanna lift up their voices and, and, and be strong. So I was one quick point, I was doing some homework with one of our team members and explaining um, as we were gathering some of the questions and tweaking some of the questions. And she said, I actually get this now. I actually get why we were doing it this way. Because, you know, again, I'm working with, you know, wonderful people, but who, like myself, who've spent their careers just sitting in rooms, taking a day or a, or a half a day, writing down a bunch of questions, deciding that's the research, and then moving on. But to actually be mindful of all the steps, um, it was finally coming together for some of them. So that was that was actually great to hear. It was like, yes, everything we're doing, it does build on itself and make sense. So, <laughs> so it's not just just doing things. So there's the these are so that's the background of where, where we are, what we're doing, and the questions that we have are the next slide. So as we're developing the demographic information, we're trying to figure out how do we socialize the use of, and should we, the use of BIPOC and non-BIPOC and my non-BIPOC versus white and non-white, not wanting to center, you know, the white experience as, as the default experience. So that's some of the questions of that we would have for this group in terms of how to socialize it. Does it make sense? What are the issues that we should navigate as we're looking at? folks from California to Virginia and who are all on their own anti-racism journey and at different places. When also with the complicated and complex language of ethnicity and race, how do we show inclusivity at the same time tell the story of strength in numbers and a perspective? Because again, if we if we list all, if we say Latinx, but we have like all these groups who encompass what Latinx is, appears to be, and we pull them out separately. A, I can see pages and pages of, of just demographic race questions, but at the same time, I don't want to, to exclude folks and say, this is how I identify. So, so that's also the question that we, we, we pose. And then as being a non, you know, non-data analyst going through this work and doing this work, you know, the idea of certainty and fit, I'm still grappling with that. So um, just would love some some thoughts. So before I finish, I just want to know, if, Daniel, is there anything that that you want to do, lift up or bring in that I that I missed or? No, I think I think that was great, Artrice. Um, you know, the We All Count data equity framework has been really helpful for us to get to the point that we are now. And um, yeah, would love to open up this space um, and dive a little deeper into these conversations um, around these questions that are on the screen now. Um, I think that'll really help us <clears throat> get into the next stage, like Artrice was saying, around um, really finalizing our, our tools that we're gonna use when we launch our research, so. We're at a really exciting point and excited to um, be able to bring you all in um, to this conversation. So thanks, Artrice. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, thank you so much, Daniel and Artrice, for, again, being willing to come here with a group of people that you are, you know, you're getting familiar with, but you certainly don't know on a day-to-day -day basis. And and share your work and um, let us know what your questions are, because uh, it is just a fabulous, fabulous project. And as you can already see in the chat, the same types of questions that we're all dealing with all the time. Um, and some of us uh, are starting to realize that we're dealing with them. And some of us uh, kind of like what you were explaining in the old days, how I was in the old days too. Like we don't even realize that we're making these choices. Um, can I ask, is it okay if I ask a clarifying question? Yes, of course. Okay, great. Um, so if I just want to make sure that I understand that the, the purpose of 
the research about the community referral networks is to kind of generate meaning that you're that you're trying to get the the information from this research on community referral networks the audience for the evidence or the information is primarily the funders and in creating that evidence for the funders you're trying to really center the voices and the experiences of BIPOC people who are experiencing the impacts of what's going on with the com community referral networks. Is that yes. right? Or have I mixed that up? No, you are absolutely correct. Cause I think our funders in this, who have, who brought this to our attention really, really want to be helpful, especially as you know, right. 2020 has unfolded and, and people are seeing that, Oh, I, we need to do something to really make a difference. And how do we do that? And so, you know, Common Spirit has been really thoughtful in that, in, in kind of creating this, this atmosphere of saying, you know, we really want to know how can we help our community? We really want to know what is the most effective way so that when we do find, have financial support and we can tell our, tell our peers in the field this is what some of the things that you should be listening to and looking for and, and supporting community. So that's really the impetus of, of the project. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Wanted to make sure I understood that. And in terms of your three very, very important questions, um, do you, what's your preference, which one we would start with today? Uh, I think maybe the middle one, <laughs> work our way out of the middle. Mm hmm so with the complicated and complex language of ethnicity and race, how do we show inclusivity at the same time that we want to tell the story of strength and numbers? And so <laughs> when I first met you, Artrees, you, you described yourself as like a data newbie. And I, I, I love that because you have, the, this question is, of course, probably one of the most important questions in data analysis. <laughs> like, Data is good at working with big groups of people. It's big, at it's good at clumping people together and like finding an average or finding a trend for a big clump of people. And when we're doing equity work, we want to acknowledge that we're going to clump people together, but we want to clump people together in ways that still respects uh, their lived experiences, their identities. We don't want to accidentally throw away their lived experiences in our technical attempts to understand their lived experiences. And so essentially this is the entire knot <laughs> that we are trying to work with. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I don't necessarily want to set myself up as like, oh, I'm going to say some answers because that's not what talking data equity is about. So what we'd really love to hear is from you folks. Um, from you folks, what have you tried when you were collecting data on ethnicity and race that worked really well, or that you would recommend? What have you tried that you wouldn't recommend? Anyone in the room want to raise their hand? Go ahead, as uh we have yeah go ahead israel hello good morning uh, so my name is israel chora i'm the assistant director of the people concern for evaluation and so we work with um, the homeless people experiencing homelessness and so with the data that we collect race and ethnicity are um often two separate questions and so in order to look at a specific um, outcome for the Latinx population, we have to kind of decipher who is in that group based on those two separate questions. And so that brings a lot of different challenges because when you look at race in itself, a lot of people who do identify as Latinx are scattered across different races. And so typically for myself, it's kind of a, well, it's like an identity crisis each time you have to answer that question. You know, it's either you know, today I feel confident enough to say I um, have indigenous roots. And then other days you kind of let people push you into the white category. And so the data itself is going to be messy. So what I tend to do is to recode the data so that we look at people that are Latinx. We kind of take that ethnicity 
as their main identity if we're trying to look at it all together. And so the issue with that is when you create Latinx kind of like as a race slash ethnicity category, you are also ignoring the differences within the Latinx population. And so a simple solution that I've kind of stuck with is to create a separate visual that highlights the diversity within the Latinx group after you've already kind of recategorized everything. Oh, that's a really cool idea. So you're so if I understand you correctly, you're collecting very detailed data and you visualize some of that nuanced detail. But when you kind of report, you still aggregate up and report some broad numbers. Exactly. Yeah. Because to our Teresa's point, they don't want to end up with a report that's 20 pages of demographics. Um, but a visual is a really interesting idea. That's great. Artrice and Daniel, yeah, do you have any uh, follow-up questions? No, that I think that's really, I think I would have, it would be great if, you know, uh, Heather will have my contact information, I'll have it on the forum to even have an example of, of what you, how you collect it in the first place um, and how you're mm -hmm. listing. Um, and so that, I think that would be a great opportunity for us to kind of noodle on that and see if that's, if that would work. Yeah, so that is to share uh, some of the work I've done. Yeah, yeah it, great. It great. Yeah. Okay, thanks. We'll we'll you can always reach out to us, Israel, if if um you are willing to share some stuff. I'm just gonna put my contact here. And Daniel and I will put our contact information in the in the chat as well. It would be cool to get a little uh, thread going in the forum where we're all sharing different ways that we're trying because we have a couple as well. Um, Daniel and Artrice, are you are you collecting in this data tool? Is it a an electronic or a paper or in person or phone? Like what's all of the above? To... All of the above because oh. because as we brought the community advisory group together, we we asked them. We said, okay, so what makes sense for the populations that you're navigating and you're working with? And that you have relationship with and and so some of them and gary being one of them said oh we can do a focus group in our you know in our location um and others said oh we can do we can hand out some surveys uh and so and we know that some of the surveys need to be paper and some well folks will have the ability to do um survey monkey and do the the, the links mm -hmm. the digital links um and so so it really is we're we're looking at it and even we're even going to do some 211 you know for 211 callers um cuz some of our our network members are a part of 211s and they can add like maybe two questions to their like laundry list of questions that they ask as a normal 211 one provider so so we're looking at this in so many different directions that's going to be really good that you have so many different data collection uh, doors and so many different modalities. We think that right now. <laughs> Hopefully, that all, <laughs> yeah, sure. so, hopefully it all true. comes together and it, and it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mish, how you doing? I am well. Sorry, I was looking. Um stuff up. I, is it okay if I yeah. ask a clarifying question first? Um, so one of the things that you talked about was uh, part of the research, and I want to make sure I understood it, was looking at how community networks are currently operating so that um, the research could see ways to support that for um, communities of color. Is that, did I understand that correctly? Yes, because there are two streams of um, research that are happening. Daniel and I are specifically talking about the client impact stream. There is a work stream that is around um, research, uh, financial research and financial investment. So my colleagues who are not on, I don't believe they're on the call, they're actually, got, they've actually worked with the, uh, the network organizations directly and had them like send budgets and had, you know, and gather information that way. Um, but we're specifically the client facing group. Okay. Okay. So I just wanted to comment on that separately before I get to your really cool questions or, or think about, um, 
I had two opportunities recently and I'll put them in the chat because if I do it after, as Heather knows, I'll forget <laughs> send the email soon enough. Um, one is I um, went to an event for some research for uh, black women in tech and um, thinking about how we create things around data and technology. And a salient theme that came up was when things are done for investors or researchers that look at how in community and particularly in um, black and brown communities where there are often networks that things work, um, when things go wrong or when things come up socially or politically, Twitter is a great example during BLM, um, those same things that have been researched are used to disrupt those community cohesions mm -hmm. and to over um, surveil. And so I guess uh, that will lead me into uh, my second piece. There's currently uh, the federal government is asking for all um, grants that come in for research grants to apply for them. Uh, it's called the peer plans. It's promoting inclusive and equitable research plans. I can drop a link to that. Um, and that's uh, something that I use in combination with um, Heather's data dictionary. Um, I've also added to, uh, I've augmented it so that it has a data index um, as well. Um, and that's just because sometimes it gets hard to see so that you can not just inventory the data, but you can see how the data was and if you've rolled it up or if you've done something to it, how it, how you, how it looked originally. And you don't have to have the actual data, but just how it's constructed in your system and how you changed it. Um, so that you can track it, um, which brings me to the second question, um, because it is complicated and complex. And so there's two different folks I like. One of them, um, I went to an amazing um, web webinar training or show, not show, web webcast um, with the National Institutes of Health. And there was a huge study across the country done on queer um, women. LGBTQIA, but it was specific to those who identified as female femme, regardless of what they might have been born at, at birth. And that data is actually not available to anyone who isn't maybe a partner organization that hasn't um, been a part of it, but the data is disaggregated the way Israel talked about. Um, so it's becoming very common in uh, the communities of color within which I work, where we just aggregate it and then we roll it up. But they did it in a way that I really like that I haven't done. Um, and it's very similar to someone that I also really like and follow and that's Dr. Um, or Professor DeAndrick T. Williams at the University of Tennessee. And so they, take a, they took a systems approach to race. And so they actually, um, equalize it. So it isn't BIPOC versus white, but it's someone who's racialized as white or someone who's racialized as black. And that's because skin tone plays into it for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And in this way, white doesn't become the norm. It just becomes how someone might be racialized. And so um, folks can, uh, in, in both that survey and in the work that folks are doing, people can choose how are you racialized and then they give their ethnic identification. And so, um, and that allows folks like say me who are Creole, who would choose Creole as our, as my, um, some native black and French, um, as my ethnic identification. And then how I'm racialized would be as, um, typically I'm racialized as a multi-ethnic, right? So I might pick other, but you might not be able to capture what I am if you only have multicultural and there isn't that option. So I think that you are correct. It's very, very um, difficult um, to do that. And what I like, and I'm happy to also write his name in the chat about his approach is he says that um, this allows for, for us to capture the social and politically um, constructed racial categories if we use terminology as racialized as versus um, either or, uh, so that we can kind of see how the construct works versus putting it on the actual racialized grouping. Um, I still okay. liked how you used Heather's stuff though. So I'm looking forward <laughs> to getting this slide because it's a really nice way um, in a project I'm doing. So it's just one more tool for me to think about, 
Oh, because I've only been using um, the data dictionary to just have really good data governance, but I like I like how you used um, some of the stuff that you use. So I don't know if that was helpful, what I said. But that's no, it's I mean. very helpful. No, it's absolutely helpful. So I, I think this is this is exactly what we were hoping to to, to gather, you know, because I think that it is, it's as many, you know, just like when you're dealing with anti-racism or dealing with you know, any kind of injustice, it's like, it takes so many different, you know, entry points to really get to, you know, a next step, you know, not a solution, obviously, but a next step. And so, so I really appreciate that. Oh, I see Fran, just one of our other, our participating network organizations has uh, popped on the screen. So Fran, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> hey, Fran. <laughs> One of the, uh, Misha is so, so helpful. And um, thank you for uh, always, as always, every time me shares the chat is like, where can we get these resources? We will definitely uh, connect you with the resources that Mish was sharing. And I, th it was such a helpful perspective that you were sharing Mish and I, I think that that's a really, the distinction between racialized and BIPOC is really important. And it kind of ties into the first thing you're asking, Artrice, because we have had a lot of trouble when we've tried to use the term racialized. We've had a lot of trouble getting people to know how to answer that question. Um, and so to kind of get to your first question, when you say socializing the use of BIPOC and non-BIPOC versus white and non-white, which I really, really uh, like because, you know, it doesn't say, it doesn't norm white as like the thing and everybody else is something else. Um, who are you trying to think about how to socialize it with? Are you trying to think about how to socialize it with the people who are going to be answering the question or with the funders? or with somebody else that I haven't thought of? I think all of the above, right? I think mm -hmm. in the work that we do at Health Leads, we're really, you know, we're really trying to dig in there and, and lift up this idea of anti-racism and really try to, to, to maybe shake folks up a little, make them uncomfortable, right? To, mm -hmm. to, to figure out how do we make change? Because, you know, no change happens when we're sitting back and feeling comfortable change happens when we're like agitated and like not not quite sure right and so i think for us it really is about about everyone and and knowing that we have a coast to coast you know project everybody's entering into their own you know anti-racism journey as an organization and as individuals in this space and so when you know when i say words like anti-racism and white supremacist culture and infrastructure i i do know that for some of the people who i'm talking with they're like taking a moment even if it doesn't show on their face they're taking a moment going okay where are we going you know and, and are and and am i presenting as an angry black woman saying these words no i'm i'm presenting as someone who's navigating american as a black woman navigating the space raising a black son navigating the space and trying to to make sure that we're all aware that there is some inequity that is happening and that we need to do something about it. Not for just myself, but for my 17 year old, about to be 18 year old son, you know? So I'm, I, I go hard at this point. And I didn't, when I was in my twenties, I was getting along, you know, going along to get along. Right. But now at 53, I'm like, hmm, I don't have time for that. And he doesn't have mm -hmm. time for that. So, mm -hmm. so when I, so when I'm, when I, when I'm saying socialize, I, I'm, I'm doing both things. I'm saying we need to get in there. And I'm aware that if I push too hard, if we hit too hard, people are just going to shut down and they're not going to hear it. So, so how do we do this nuanced thing that we, we need to do when it comes to race and ethnicity and, and inclusion, and especially in a country right now that is yeah. working really hard to take it out of our schools, take it out of our mind, take it out of our mouths, because yeah. it's, you know, it's racist to talk about racism. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you folks think 
What kind of uh, support resources do you have for this question about how can you push this forward? Socializing the use of, you know, whatever language is appropriate, whether it is BIPOC or racialized, but making sure that we can ask these questions in a way that doesn't center whiteness that doesn't accidentally or intentionally, depending on who you are and where you are, perpetuate white supremacy when you're in the act of collecting data about health networks, community platforms to connect people with resources and their ethnicity or race. Go ahead, Stephanie. Hey, it's so good to see you. Hi, it's good to be here. I always love these conversations and learn so much from them. Um, I was recently at a training hosted by the state of Minnesota's Department of Education and learned that they are actually creating some new definitions. Uh, they are finding that uh, American Indian experiences are being lost in this two or more race category. And uh, parents and students were really vocalizing that their, their experiences were not being captured in the data that was available. And so they created a new definition of American Indian and are asking people to answer kind of two questions, one being uh, the federally defined one, and then two being the, the state defined definition of American Indian. And uh, in that definition, if someone answers that they are white and American Indian or Asian and American Indian, for example, they would go into the American Indian um, demographic group, regardless of the other identities that they listed. So they're still able to share all of their identities while not being put in the two or more categories so that uh, when the analyses are being done, they're being done for anyone who identifies as American Indian. So it's interesting to see some of the creative solutions that people are trying um, as as everyone's navigating, I think, this demographic conversation. That is really, really helpful. So they're, they're finding a way to center the lived experiences of First Nations American Indians, regardless of kind of how an external organization is wanting you to collect the data. That's very smart. Yes, and they've actually um, taken the definition a little more narrow as well, including uh, Native American in the United States, Canada, and um, Alaska. And so it's not necessarily capturing Indigenous at a, a global scale, but looking at I it see. specifically through that lens. So I think that was some of the, the parent conversations that had happened that drew them to that new defi definition. Ah, okay. That's very, very interesting. Thank you. And somebody else is building in the chat on this that um, everybody is not, everybody who might be categorized as BIPOC is not comfortable with BIPOC, which of course is the case with every single, um, is, is the fundamental problem with trying to put people in groups, uh, is that we're, we're trying to capture something that is by definition an individual experience and we're always going to lose nuance. So it's, but what's really important as our Therese and Stephanie are both saying is paying attention to whose nuance we lose and well, who we're centering when we make those decisions. Dennis, you've been waiting so patiently. <laughs> Thanks. Actually, they already <laughs> talked to what I was thinking of oh. bringing up. Um, I, uh, on the side, so just for those who want to know, I am a uh, uh, cancer epidemiologist here in Colorado. And with, with my group, I've been putting together a list of data equity red flags, and this being one of them. And it's, and we are saying racializing the reference group, which is most often here, non-Hispanic white. One of the things we were saying is that it centers uh, whiteness as the base standard to which other racial and ethnic groups must aspire to achieve health. And that tends to be, well, obviously a huge issue. And we say it, it often happens because we're not considering other groups or their outcomes. So both from the health perspective, from the uh, quantitative perspective, there's a problem because our numbers will shift and change quite a bit depending on where you center your story. 
and from the more social aspect, just having the conversation with folks saying, all right, what, what is the goal here? The goal is to, in our case, achieve health. It's not to achieve whiteness, it's to achieve health. And that's a huge distinction that we don't make too often. Unfortunately, the two get conflated based on the numbers that we've had in the past, which is one of the big reasons why we need to rethink how we do it. And so one of the, what we said is uh, consider in advance which group should serve as the reference group and why that particular group. There has to be a good justification for whomever we're setting as our 1.0. And But like I said, most people have already talked to this, so I don't have a ton to add, but thanks for the moment. Oh, no worries, of course. Uh, so I think, Atrice, you're getting a lot of support <laughs> for the use of BIPOC and non-BIPOC. And in, in my experience, if you can include a, even one sentence in, in the communication to your funders, or not necessarily your funders, but the funders of these um, platforms that you're trying to move the needle with, I have found that a lot of times that sentence about why you're doing it will be enough socialization, especially if the funders that you have are already at least not at the very, very earliest part of their anti-racism journey. Um, and they can see that as an opportunity. Hey, Rebecca. Hi. Hello. Um, I, I appreciate what you, Heather, what you just said around like the sentence around the justification. Um, and then Dennis, I, I actually previously used to work at CDPHE as well. And so I wanted to share one of the perspectives that I heard in some of my work there where um, we were advocating to change some of the comparison groups to decenter the white perspective and experience. Um, and we heard from some of our community members and, and our colleagues that they actually wanted us to maintain that comparison because they felt like that comparison was visualizing what racism, the difference that racism was, a, it was a proxy for the impact of racism. Um, you know, and it's, it's not a perfect piece, but that was, we ended up keeping it and including a sentence around why. Um, and I think I would just offer that there's, rarely a, a perfectly right or a perfectly, well, there's probably some perfectly wrong solutions, but some, yeah. a perfectly right, but being able to, to justify with the people that you're, I think to Heather's first question, that you're doing the work for and the, the audience for it and, and whose perspective um, you're justifying it with, um, I think is a really critical piece in being able to, to explain that why. Um, so I, I would just offer that as another experience I had in, in, in doing some of this research and trying to navigate the space and, and reflect the wishes of our community members. That's okay. I'd love to respond really quickly. I love that perspective first. Thank you. And uh, one of the things we do, especially on the quantitative side, is something very common when we cross tabulate, do our contingency table two by two, call it what you will. And I've mentioned this before, it's, we tend to do these between group variations, which in my view measures stratification, it does not measure intersectionality. So right. putting that aside, <laughs> one sure. thing that we are trying more to do is use within group variation. So that way we can see the non-monolithic uh, textures to any group that we have, because it's easy to say that this title fits this entire group and rarely does it ever. I don't think it ever really has. But looking at it within group, you get a much more robust picture of where any exposure and outcome might be. You know, that's a great suggestion that kind of brings together, um, Artrice, your top two questions. Because, um, and we had some examples of that in the Talking Data Equity a couple of weeks ago that had Elliot Holder who he was the person who was talking about how he was talking about data visualization and how visualizing averages actually um, was promoting stereotyping and and exactly the stuff that um, Dennis and Misha are talking about. And that one of the ways that you could roll the data up 
and maintain that strength in numbers perspective that you want while allowing for um, illustrating how much variety there is, is to figure out a way to make a table or make a visualization. Um, and we're very, very happy to get involved in that with you as a follow-up that shows all the variation, which means you don't even have to have collected a whole bunch of very specific types of ethnicity and race data. If you think that's going to be placing too heavy of a burden on the people that you're collecting data from. Um, that's a very, very good idea. I thank you for saying that, uh, that brings together a bunch of threads that we've been talking about here on the Fridays. Um, and also I think that I just heard you say, what about the possibility of, instead of saying BIPOC and non-BIPOC or racialized and not racialized, what about experiencing racism and not experiencing racism? Um, so that it's not about them at all. It's about like, the, the, we're not trying to, we're not trying to achieve whiteness. We're trying to achieve health is a very, very cool way of putting it. Um, so how do we communicate that very clearly is very cool. Okay. <laughs> so we're very, very close uh, to the end of today. And um Artrice and Daniel and Christina and Heba have been just really so, so brave to be willing to come and, and uh, share their process. It's such a humanizing, connecting thing to do that I can't, I can't overstate how grateful I am that you folks were willing to do this. Um, and I want to make sure that we leave the last couple of minutes for anything that you folks want to say, anything you want to share, any other requests for resources, because of course, we'll make sure that you get all the resources as well. Daniel, is there anything that... Yeah, I just want to say thank you. It's been a really great conversation today with you all. Um, and thank you to you, Heather, for letting us use this platform to have this conversation. We, we really appreciate it. Um, a lot of really helpful, helpful insight. And definitely we're gonna bring this back again, like we said to our community advisory group and talk about you know, how we can continue to incorporate this into our research moving forward. But it's, it's been a lot of great conversation today. So thank you everyone. And I echo exactly what Daniel is saying. This has been just, wow, like so great and so helpful. And like it has my brain just moving in a thousand, thousand different directions. So uh, so hopefully we can be able to synthesize a lot of this, you know, and we'll look to our, our partners, Fran and Gary, you know, to as we kind of continue this conversation to really kind of be thinking about all of this. Um, going forward but Heather it's been an absolute pleasure and I really 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 appreciate you and the work you do and the access you've created and so so thank you so very much it is entirely my pleasure and um it has been a really really our experiment was a success <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we are going to leave it here. Uh, and we will be back next Friday. So um, if, tune in next Friday for another topic and a, another conversation. Um, and for the rest of today, please take very, very good care of yourself. You are a very important person. And please take very good care of the people around you because that is our only hope. <laughs> All right. Thanks again to the whole health leads team and we will see you all uh, next Friday. Bye everybody. <laughs>